it doesn't really matter what your political position is on anything if your vote doesn't count. It's, it's, it's the fun, fundamental act of being a citizen. It is, you know, that, uh, that casting of the vote. And it should put the citizen as close to the process as possible. Ballots are the bright line between c civility and chaos. They are what separates rogue nations from free ones. We know that our election process um, is not good. We know that there are a lot of problems with it. If a voting machine makes an error, uh, either unintentionally or through malice, I want there to be a very good chance that it'll be caught. It's gone from, from those ballots being physical documents that anybody can look at and read, uh, being counted in plain open sight, to those documents now being turned into digital ephemeral data and being counted inside a black box machine on proprietary software. The computer says, I counted one, two, three, and no matter how many times you ask the computer, it's going to say, I counted one, two, three. Maybe voter mark three, two, one, but there's no way to see that because there's nothing. It's off in cyberspace. A piece of paper is durable and permanent and transparent to anyone who wants to look at it, whereas a piece of digital data is ephemeral and can be changed like that, and nobody would know about it. There are a lot of things that, um, that cause one to wonder about the wisdom of handing over our voting process to private corporations. Not only um, the heads of these companies and their support of certain political parties, there is also fraud in the background of these companies. They're saying, trust us, and I don't. I don't have any reason to believe they're doing bad things, but I don't want to trust anyone with the integrity of my vote. I'll trust a group of people with different interests, you know, people from different political parties watching the polls, but I don't want to put the control of my government in the hands of a voting machine company. The most important premise of American voting today and what we've had for quite a long time now in our system is the secret ballot. I mean, it used to be that, you know, people would vote by going into the town square and holding up their hands and everybody knew how everybody was voting. Around 1856 in Victoria, Australia, there was a, uh, they devised a standardized way of voting by paper ballot. And it really became the gold standard that is still used today. Uh, the ballot was standardized, all the candidates were listed on it. The government paid for this, for the printing of the ballot. Every voter got one ballot. They were allowed to mark it privately, but it was being cast and counted publicly. We used paper ballots originally all throughout the country in all of our elections up until uh, the turn of the century when the automatic voting machine was developed, the lever machine. The early lever machines had all of those choices register through a lever, a little lever that you push up or down. Electronic voting systems started being implemented in the late 1990s. What's, you know, supposedly the most modern voting system are these fully computerized voting systems that use a touchscreen terminal or something like that. When you're looking at a touchscreen system or what they call a DRE, a direct recording electronic, so it's some sort of kiosk where the votes are going in and then they're recorded internally to it. Um, that seems most analogous to the old style lever machines. We've basically gone from largely paper-based voting systems that rely a little bit on software to count the ballots to totally computerized voting systems that are entirely paperless, have no audit trail, and no ability to verify the accuracy of those automated vote totals. If a voting machine makes an error, uh, either unintentionally or through malice, I want there to be a very good chance that it'll be caught, just like if there's a banking error through an accidental error in arithmetic or through embezzlement, that there's a high probability of that being caught. After the Florida 2000 vote counting problems, there was this, you know, widespread hand wringing that went on across the country. Why are we using these old voting systems? Americans were shocked to 
to discover some of these flaws, some of these glitches in the election process. And you can remember them holding up those ballots and looking at those chads and all that. After that Florida November 2000 fiasco, they went to touchscreen voting all across the state, all at one, all at one time. Huge influx of money. They had a, their next election was the uh, primary of 2002. It was the biggest disaster in the history of voting, but since it was a primary, it wasn't close, nobody was looking at it. I mean, they had just one disaster after another. The problem we had in Florida 2002 was that in the same three counties, some of the same counties that we had problems with the punch cards, we now had problems with the DRE machines in the 2002 Janet Reno primary. Again, another quarter million votes vanished into bowels of the machines. We don't know where they were. They disappeared. They were pulled out by some sort of extraction process, and all sorts of havoc was, was taking place again. And after that, the Help America Vote Act legislation did go through and pass. The Help America Vote Act provides billions of dollars in federal funding. We're still not sure how much will eventually be authorized, but the original bill was $3.9 billion in federal matching funds to states that eliminate older voting systems, which are specifically described as the punch card and the lever voting machines. There's some $3.8 billion of federal tax money that is available to the states sort of dangling out there as like a carrot. You can get this money if you change some of your voting systems, if you centralize your voter registration databases, if you um, get some additional disabled accessible equipment, and asking the states to do this in order to get the money. These are huge contracts. Um, L.A. County, if it were to go all touch screen, which their registrar of voters wants to do, would cost $100 million just to purchase the machines. There's nothing in the, in the Help America Vote Act that, that speaks to the ongoing cost of touchscreen voting. What happens 10 years down the road when all this equipment um, begins to break down? We spent $3.8 billion. We're going to spend another $3.8 billion? Is the federal government going to fork that over, or is that going to be taken up by the states and the communities? Voting is not like anything else. It's not like your ATM. It's not like paying your bills. It's not like these functions that you do over and over again throughout the day, week, and year where you always have confirmation of what you did. I think that the voting transaction is the most complex and difficult transaction to do securely that anyone could think of because of the unique nature of the secret ballot. Imagine if a bank uh, had to do business uh, and at the end of the day throw away all the information about who made what transaction. But that's the security requirement we have for voting machines is they can't keep the information on who voted for whom and yet they have to be secure. So it's a very challenging problem. In the case of voting, we have to be able to cast our ballots anonymously, and we also want to be able to audit it for correctness. Like take your bank ATMs, for example. There's a little camera staring at you that's you know, seeing you actually take your money out of the ATM. You know who went up to the ATM to put new money in it and who collected those little pieces of envelopes at the end of the day. So all of that is completely auditable. Every single transaction is audited. On election day in California, at the beginning of the, the voting day, the poll workers are required in the procedures to open up the ballot box and show the first voter who comes in to the polling place that the box is empty. And similarly, in New York, when it comes to opening up the polling places on those mechanical lever machines, two poll workers have to sign a sworn statement saying that they opened up the machine, they looked at the counters on the back of the machine, and they said zero. So we have these, these procedures that provide the kind of transparency that the public needs to make sure that we can trust the outcome of elections. We haven't replicated these procedures in computerized voting systems. I mean, when you go to a touchscreen machine, if you're the first voter, you can see, I mean, the, they, they'll print out a tape of the, of the machine before the election that shows on the paper record that everything's set to zero. But the poll workers aren't opening up the back of the machine and looking at the software and seeing that the software doesn't have any pre-stored votes in there. People know how to use computers for mundane things, and they know how to build products with computers in them. And if you're not worried about security, whether somebody can modify the, the software in the, program, in the computers, or you're not striving for extremely high levels of reliability, it's straightforward to do. 
And so people have gotten involved in computerizing voting processes without having the knowledge or proper appreciation for how difficult the task is that they're taking on. There are basically two things that could go wrong with an election when it comes to counting the votes. Number one, someone made a mistake. And accidents happen in elections all the time. And I've got plenty of examples that document the kinds of unintentional problems that have come up in elections where someone failed to check the software, someone didn't do the test before the election that they were supposed to do, or where the software uh, was misprogrammed so the candidates' names were switched, so the results that were released were actually the reverse. I mean, this happens all the time. In place after place that are deploying these systems in Dallas, Texas, um, a couple of years ago, there you had uh, machines where when you pressed for the Democratic candidates, it would only light up for the Republican candidates. Um, there was also three different precincts where it was uh, fairly certain that when you cast votes for this one particular candidate, um, her name would, would be lit up and then it would blink off. With the computerized voting systems, the public is wholly dependent on their local election official who is the intern wholly dependent on their vendor to get everything right. A lot of these things, the vendor says, oh yeah, we're investigating it, and then it gets dropped on the floor, including major problems, like uh, the governor's race in Alabama being apparently decided by machine error. It always goes back to some spokesperson for the company that sold the voting system, assuring the public that, yes, we had this glitch, but uh, we got it all worked out, and you know maybe we lost a couple votes here and there, but it wasn't enough to change the outcome of any election. That's the line I've read over and over again. It wasn't enough to change the outcome of, of any election. How do you know that? How do you know that? You don't know that. What I find the most galling of the, the arguments that come from the proponents of the touchscreen voting systems and, and these companies who say, um, who say that we should trust them and that voter fraud isn't a problem and, you know, we don't have a problem with voter fraud. You know, I was thinking uh, if I was going to tamper with an election, well, first of all, what kind of person would want to tamper with an election? And everyone seems to assume, oh, the candidate wants to go out and rig his own election. That's not necessarily how I look at it. Think of all the other people who would want to mess with elections, foreign governments, major contractors who get a lot of money from the government whose economic future is depending on federal policy, uh, organized crime. So, so lots of entities who would be highly motivated to mess with elections and can bring to bear lots of resources to do that. They could easily bribe people in the companies. They could probably buy the companies. If you were going to uh, buy an election, what kind of people would you go to to give your money to? In an electronic voting system, the people who have direct access to the votes are the programmers and also the t uh, support technicians. And then one of the things that I would do if I was looking at uh, buying them off, you don't want to approach the wrong person because they might tell on you. So you would want to find somebody who had, some, who had a record or s somebody who had financial problems. You would kind of get an idea as to who to approach. And um, I also called some programmers. I'd say, if you wanted to rig one of these machines, how would you do it? And they would tell me how you would go about it precisely. And, and as we started talking about what things to do, uh, <laughs> it was like a challenge for these guys. And some of them were like, well, you know, I could, I could rig one of these. One guy would say, well, you know, you could put together a special kind of ballot that would go through and you could rig the election by casting a vote. I walk up to the voting machine and instead of touching the candidate that I want, I get four fingers out and I put them in particular spots on the screen at the same time and I enable a secret mode that nobody knows about, but I uh, have a contact who was one of the programmers of this machine and at that point, I, it, it changes the tally to, to make 90% of the votes be for the candidate I wanted. There's nothing that you can do when you're testing the machine to test for that except trying every combination of fingers on the screen that you can think of which is not part of the normal testing procedure of these machines. If I, was, if I was going to tamper with a national election and try to do something on a national scale, say a presidential scale, I don't know that I would write some special algorithm in, you know, to just flip votes to one candidate. I think I would do something that was still more strategic and say, well, we've got certain key states, like Florida, we've got certain key areas within those states, 
And I would go after those, and I would probably do it with a triggering mechanism so that it was something that was built in, because uh, you can do that with a very small amount of code. And it was sort of sitting there waiting, you know. And when the signal comes, you know, I mean, so that way you could put such a thing into all the programs nationwide and then just invoke it in the ones you want. I stumbled across Bev Harris's site where she was talking about voting machines and the ownership uh, of the stock in voting machine companies, specifically ES and S, and how you had a United States senator who had owned stock in a company that was counting votes for his own election. We had a couple of phone calls discussing that topic, and I just out of the blue asked her, I said, have you ever considered doing a book on this? Uh, we had envisioned it as a very short book, maybe 100, 120, 150 pages. Just simple, you know, let them know that this is something we should look at in the future. And we were kind of winding it up, and uh, David Allen said, well, you know, we don't know anything about these touchscreen machines. It's really frustrating. And he said, you know, you really need to get a hold of a technical manual. Of course, they don't publish those on the websites of the voting machine companies. I went to ESNS, that was the big one I was really looking at at the time, and it said info at ESSvote.com for more information. And I thought, oh, well, maybe the people who work there have ESSvote.com on their email. And so I put ESSvote.com in Google search engine, and um, sure enough, I found about 40 people who work for ESNS, and I thought, well, let me just go get some more names. <laughs> so I'll go get Sequoia voting system names, and I got some of them, and then I thought, I'll go get um, Diebold now. And I found that they had been called Global Election Systems. They had purchased it quite recently, actually. And I'm busily copying down the names of the different programmers that pop out. There was quite a few. And just going page by page. And it took me to a page. It was an old Global Election Systems web page. And I thought, well, let me just take a look through this and see what I can find. And there was one little button that said FTP. And I didn't quite know what that would take me to. So I clicked it. And it just took me to this page that had a bunch of um, files on it, file folders on it. And what they had done, it was like, it's, it's like what you do on your computer where you f have a bunch of files where you keep stuff. Only they kept it on the web and it was a filing system for the company. And there was about 40,000 files on this site. These are the touchscreen machines made by Diebold plus uh, the software required to tally you know, collect and tally the votes in an election. This is not unusual. These type of sites can be found all over the place. What was unusual was there was absolutely no security on it. There was not even a single, quote, no trespassing sign. So they had all the technical manuals. <laughs> I said, did I do good? <laughs> I, I found some. Pretty much the, 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 the blueprints to the vault. Everything that you would need to know uh, if you were going to look to hack one of these machines. I got a call from Professor David Dill from Stanford and he called and asked me if I had heard uh, that the code for the Diebold voting machine was available on the internet and he explained to me that this was one of the primary vendors of electronic touchscreen voting machines and that companies typically are very proprietary about the code and, and it's not public so no one's ever had a chance to see what's going on inside these machines. He asked me if I was interested in doing a security analysis of uh, the code in this machine. By the end of two weeks, we had finished a 24-page report which outlined all kinds of security vulnerabilities. The day before we were going to go public with the report, I went to the Diebold site just to see some things, and I really didn't know that much about Diebold. And at the, at the top of the, of the web page was a headline saying, uh, the state of Maryland announces a $55.6 million purchase of 11,000 Diebold voting machines. And this was the day before we were going to release a report saying that those machines are totally insecure. So uh, the New York Times the next day ran a story. It was not a front page story, but it was a reasonable size story. Basically summarizing our report, uh, the Washington Post the next day ran a front page story on it, as did the Baltimore Sun. The significant thing about the Johns Hopkins report was that it forced Diebel to finally have to respond to the criticisms of its system. Um, up until then, Diebold was able to dismiss criticism as the work of crackpots or the opinions of hysterics. But here was a group of very skilled and serious academics who very systematically went through the software to discover things that were wrong with it. Diebold came at me pretty hard. 
Um, the people who had certified the Diebold voting machines uh, tried to get me fired and came after me and, and never contacted me directly but contacted the, the university's president and the head of our institute here uh, and tried to create a lot of friction for me unsuccessfully. Bev was searching through the files, you know, trying to understand what the various files are. And, it, you know, typical of software, you wind up with files with very cryptic names that you, you know, make perfect sense to the programmer, but make absolutely no sense to anyone else. So in trying to understand files and what they are and what they're doing, she stumbled across a folder called Rob Georgia. Well, one of the things I did was I wanted to see if, if Rob was a verb or a noun. <laughs> so I thought I'll call up Diebold and ask him. Is there a guy named Rob who works in Georgia? And they insisted there was not. But then I got an email, and the email said, maybe I'm the Rob you're looking for. I'm the Rob they say there isn't, doesn't exist or some such thing. He was such a straightforward, nice guy. It was one of the most straightforward interviews I was able to get. Usually when you interview voting people, they dodge all over the place, and you can't get a straight answer, and you have to ask it six different ways. But I would say to Rob Georgia, what do you think Rob Georgia was? And he'd say, it was a patch. A patch is a, uh, is a fix, kind of like how you'll patch a tire, that's where the term comes from. If you get a hole in, the, in, in your tire, you, you put a patch on it and, and then it's fixed. Same thing with the program. If the program has a hole in it, it has an error, uh, it's, instead of going back and rewriting the entire code, you change just the code necessary to fix the problem. This company had probably sold its biggest contract ever in the history of the United States elections when they sold the whole state of Georgia. It was kind of, as these things are, they were, you know, really scrambling and things were going wrong and so forth. So they shipped these machines. Supposedly, they're supposed to go through all this testing. Well, Rob had that job of testing it when it arrives at the state. He was working in the Diebold warehouse as its deployment manager. Basically, he handled 22,000 machines throughout the state. In Diebold's warehouse, he set them up, got them ready, shipped them out to the counties. He told us that there were numerous problems with the machines, that they were um, not booting up, they were freezing or crashing. Diebold and engineers had sent him and his crew um, patches. Uh, he counted three patches in all. We know the fourth one that was uh, put on the systems after that. These patches were never certified. Diebold simply handed them down to the people in the warehouse and said apply them to all 22,000 machines. I looked up Georgia Law. And it says, you may not make any modifications without recertifying. Putting a modification on will decertify the system. The software is supposed to be certified. The election software is supposed to be checked out by what's called an ITA, an independent testing authority, who will look at the software and make sure that the, it's appropriate for what it's supposed to do. It knows how to count. Uh, there's nothing funny going on as far as how votes are assigned or tallied, that it, it, it uh, uh, complies with the uh, uh, applicable state and federal law. You know, it, once the software has been certified, that version of the software can be used in the field and no other. Diebold would tell you that they weren't major changes and so that's why they wouldn't have to tell anyone about them. It comes to a, a process of relying on the vendor to certify themselves, basically, to um, tell us what the patch does, to tell us that it doesn't do anything that it shouldn't do, um, and to tell us that we should trust them, basically. Not too long after this report was published in the New York Times, which was authored by Avi Rubin and the other three, Adam Stubblefield, Yoshi Kono, and Dan Wallach, a person with inside access uh, who had used an employee ID number to access uh, files with Diebold leaked about 15,000 memos. It was 1.8 gigabytes of data taken off of a Diebold staff server. And this contains internal company emails. And those include uh, announcements about new software coming out. It's their bug announcements. It's conversations going back and forth between employees about fixes that they're making to the systems. It includes um, sales talk as well. These things showed a pattern of deception. They showed a huge amount of use of uncertified, untested software. Uh, they showed some ethical violations. Uh, they showed a lot of, a lot of problems with quality control. You know, you had, you had new software releases where they were announcing 200 bugs were fixed, <laughs> and the bugs were serious, like, uh, it doesn't count right. 
there's a um, small collection of memos going back and forth where they're discussing a significant change to the software. And they're discussing the fact that the, the election officials will not allow this so late in the game. It's coming up very close to the election in 2002. And the solution is just to call it a bug fix and put it through. The memos show them working around issues in the field in order to convince people to buy the machines. When problems are introduced to the engineers, um, they come up with workarounds just to get around the testing. They're discussing the fact that they have uh, sold El Paso County, Colorado, some software that didn't exist and that nobody quite figured out how to make, but they sold it. And in order to pick up the check, they needed to do a demonstration, but they didn't have anything to do the demonstration with. So he writes, for the demo, I suggest you fake it. That's what we did before. It worked well. <laughs>
manila envelopes filled with twenty to forty thousand dollars of cash. His instructions were to fly to Louisiana and put this in the desk drawer of the Louisiana Elections Commissioner, Jerry Fowler. He did this five times. He claims that um, he doesn't know what was in those envelopes and he didn't realize it was wrong. My contention is this. If we have somebody who is that naive that thinks that there might be nothing wrong with taking a manila envelope with something you don't know what it is but it's shaped like cash and putting it in the desk drawer of an election commissioner, maybe this person is too naive to be around our voting machines. The three largest companies are ESNS, Diebold, and Sequoia. Um, Bob and Todd Yurosevich, two brothers, control two of the top companies, ESNS and Diebold. Bob is president of the election system division of Diebold. His brother Todd is a vice president at ESNS. Bob and Todd um, started a company called American Information Systems, which eventually became ESNS. Bob left American Information. He started a company called um, iMark. iMark was purchased by a Canadian company called Global Election Systems. Global Election Systems was then purchased by Diebold. Global Election Systems was purchased by Diebold and turned into Diebold Election Systems. They started the company in 1988 as a company called North American Professional Technologies, which was actually um, a division of macro trends. You look up the word macro trends and all kinds of things break loose that you don't want to see in a voting machine company. Two of the people who were originally with the company when it was macro trends, North American professional technologies, are still with Diebold election systems. So they've gone all the way through for about 15 years now. These two programmers' names are Guy Lancaster and Talbot Iredale. Talbot Iredale of the famous memo for Volusia County. And they were hired by three convicted felons. One of the guys' name is Norton Cooper. Norton Cooper was jailed by the Canadian government for defrauding the government. Another of the guys, his name was Charles Hong Lee, originally from Hong Kong. Um, he kind of left the company around the early 90s, but uh, their third cohort and his business partner for many years was a guy named Michael K. Gray. He became the director of Global Election Systems. He was a director for two years. Um, Right before he became a director, he stole $18 million from four companies in Canada. He was arrested in the U.S., did four years there, ended up going back to Canada. He's still in jail. Uh, but these three guys, there's no doubt about it, they were um, problematical and they hired these two programmers. These two programmers, we know from the Diebold memos, have a habit of uploading uncertified software and having it then downloaded into voting machines without it being looked at. It could be that they're, you know, great guys, but you have to look at it. So we started looking a little more recently and we found uh, that there was a couple more guys we should take a look at. They live in Washington State. One of the guys name is Jeffrey Dean. He uh, was right up until the time that Diebold purchased the company. He was the a director of Global Election Systems and he was also its senior vice president. Um, Jeffrey Dean did five years for embezzlement the embezzlement he did was actually 23 counts of embezzlement. It involved computer fraud of a very sophisticated nature, and it involved exploiting a position of trust to manipulate computer data and embezzle money. He got out of jail in 1995. He had $87 in his account. He owed $388,000 in restitution. He got out in August, and by the end of 95, he was the owner of a printing and mailing company, which he then turned around and sold to Global Election Systems for a million dollars. And here's what he did while he was with Diebold and Global Election Systems. He was hired to come into the King County database and create a voter registration system for them. He was given the passcode to the computer, the key to the computer room, and 24-hour access to the building. Um, his friend, John Elder, who is his friend he was in prison with, that was on a, a drug trafficking conviction for cocaine, prints the ballots and the punch cards for not just Washington State, but for most of the country for Diebold. What this indicates is that, oh, maybe these guys are great, they're reformed and everything, but maybe we should do criminal background checks because they certainly have had a lot of access. So there are a lot of things that um, 
that caused one to wonder about the wisdom of handing over our voting process to private corporations. Both Sequoia and Diebold have allowed their software to be exposed through public internet FTP sites. And, you know, this from the companies who say, you should trust us, we know how to protect your ballots. Well, they can't even protect their corporate software. They leave it sitting out on internet servers. If they can't protect their own software, I don't have confidence that they can protect our ballots. You know, in a lot of government functions, we have a lot of software used that's been privately written. Uh, so that's not a problem per se. But if you have a situation, as we do now, where there isn't a way of holding the private contractor accountable if their machines make certain kinds of mistakes, and furthermore, if you have the elections offices being intensely dependent upon the technology expertise of the vendors, I think you have a very bad situation. Someone introduced me to the phrase regulatory capture. And regulatory capture is the condition that you have when the regulators and the regulated in an industry become so closely intertwined that the regulators only go to the regulated for information and ideas. The area of elections has gotten so technologically um, complicated that uh, registrars have had to hire uh, computer people and they, they oftentimes enter into relationships with voting companies to do certain tasks. What I've noticed is that the revolving door swings awfully fast between the voting equipment companies and the election officials. I can think of off the top of my head five former elections officials from the state of California who now work as representatives and salespeople for the voting equipment companies. So then it becomes not such a surprise after all why these people would be so supportive of the machines. The mark of a legitimate government is one that has earned the informed consent of the governed. And the way that you win that informed consent is through elections. And you can only have uh, free and fair elections when they're conducted in plain sight, not in secret, which is the case right now. Even if elections were perfect using computers, um, it, it's also important that we feel that we're a part of the process. And I think that, that by pushing our, ourselves away, that we're moving ourselves away from the actual act of ballot casting and ballot counting, all of the things that the poll workers used to do on election day made them and the rest of us who knew those people and they were your community members feel some confidence in the election. By pushing these things away, is some sort of technological elite, some guru like myself. Certainly, I can understand election computers. But I wouldn't want people like myself, or even myself, in charge of elections. It should be all people in the community. And it shouldn't be pushed away just to, to trust these technological gurus that it's being done correctly. Everyone should be accessible to elections and understand that elections are being run fairly. This is what we call transparency. And transparency in the process in, involves not just being able to see the code, but being able to see the entire process of the election. What we've witnessed here with the whole Debold scenario is a complete and utter lack of transparency. This company uh, went out, hid out in their labs, developed a voting machine without any security expertise, without any uh, government requirements on them, and didn't have to pass any kind of rigorous security certification. And lo and behold, their systems are out in the field counting votes. And, and when anybody asks them, how does the machine work? Can we see the design of the machine? Can we see the code? The voting machine companies say, no, that's proprietary. We shouldn't be in the position of having to prove somehow the machines can be hacked, although I think we've done a pretty good job of explaining how that can be done. The vendors ought to be proving to us that the machines can't be hacked or that they haven't been hacked, and they've totally fallen down on that. We had transparent voting systems that anybody, no matter how smart you were, if you cared and you wanted to understand what was going on, you could figure it out. You could go watch the ballots being counted. And people do watch the ballots being counted. And we had a window into the voting system, and it's like that window's been shuttered and there's broken glass all over the floor. Suddenly we can't peer in any, anymore, and we have to just take the elections officials and these vendors at their word that everything's coming out all right, and that's not good enough. The fact 
fact that these vendors are so closely entwined in the whole election process is a little disturbing. Elections officials are relying on Diebold and ESNS and Sequoia and these companies to explain their systems to them. When there are glitches on election night, when problems happen, these Diebold employees are there and they're giving information and they're explaining to people what to do, how to restart machines, how to re-upload if there's a glitch here, if there's a problem with the database. The employees are there. There you go. Okay. No. There you go. In touch review. Review shows you exactly who you voted for. Oh, okay. Now for the fall, we've got a certification package that's going up now. For the fall, this screen will automatically come up at the end. Well, in a simpler America, I guess I would say it this way, that we used to um, count votes at the precinct by hand. That a group of senior citizens most often would gather around the table, open up the wooden ballot box, dump the ballots out, and count the X's on the paper. That didn't take a whole lot of training to do. Our polling places are staffed by these people who essentially are volunteers. Uh, we have a hard time recruiting them in the first place and a lot of our polling places in California are in people's garages and in churches and in other places that may not have the most reliable source of electricity. The voting machines that we currently use in California, the computerized voting machines, are very heavy and they need to be delivered to polling places with the older punch card systems, the poll workers would get the voting equipment all loaded into their car and drive it to the polling place, and that poll worker would be responsible for that equipment. With the touchscreen voting machines, the voting machines are being, being delivered to polling places. Again, maybe someone's garage or in a church or some other public building uh, the day or a couple days before the election, and they're sitting overnight. You have this tiny, cheap little plastic seal on the back that the poll workers are supposed to make sure isn't broken, but you can buy them on the internet for like 29 cents each. It's not, you know, it's not, if you wanted to commit fraud, it's not hard. These machines um, introduce a lot of complexities for poll workers who in the past didn't have to worry about anything more than um, setting up a punch card machine and taking the ballots and, and handling the roster. The training of poll workers is critical. They make it or break it on election day. They are being taught sort of in a linear fashion you do this, you do this, you do that. If you make a mistake or change your mind, you just touch that box again and the check mark goes what do you away. Mean right here? Right? Oh. And all the circles come back. That's great. Thank you. This screen shows you exactly who you're running for. But they're not trained at all in, in, in keeping an eye out for and doing anything about any of the kind of risks associated with computerized voting. There might not even be a phone in the polling place. I live in Alameda County, which is one of the first counties to go um, system-wide with electronic voting in California. The county purchased 4,000 machines um, last year at a cost of about $12 million. So I was very interested to see these machines in action. At the morning when the poll opens at 6 a.m., the poll supervisor runs a zero tally on each machine at the precinct. What this essentially means is that they do a printout on each machine that indicates that there are no votes currently stored on the machine. The poll worker is supposed to show the first voter in line these zero counts as a certification that um, these machines are all zero. So I arrived at 6 a.m. because I wanted to be that first voter at my precinct to see those zero tallies. But when I arrived, the poll workers were quite frantic because one of their colleagues hadn't shown up. And the poll supervisor was trying to get the machines daisy chained and all connected and he wasn't uh, succeeding very well. And so he asked me, as I'm standing there, if I would help them. And I explained to him that I had gone through the poll worker training, and so I knew how to do it, and he was quite relieved. And he asked me if I could stay, and he knew that I was a reporter, and he asked me if I could stay and help them. And I ended up staying until around 4.30 that afternoon. I was the most uh, trained person at my precinct. And even though there was a person who was actually supposed to be the poll supervisor, I was answering a lot of questions for voters that he couldn't answer, and I was answering a lot of questions for him that he couldn't answer. People didn't know, for instance, whether or not the votes were stored on the card that they take out of the machine. They were concerned. Well, if I take the card out and it's got all my votes on it and I hand it back to you, what happens if you lose that card? So this is something, this is basic information that poll workers aren't given. I had read the SAIC report, I had read the Johns Hopkins report, and one of the criticisms that both Diebold and the SAIC report had 
was that there were a lot of things mentioned by the Johns Hopkins researchers that couldn't be done because poll supervisors and workers would notice it. And basically, I was able to confirm that that's not the case at all. Um, as a poll supervisor you are, or a poll worker, you are highly overworked. You have a, an influx of people all at one time. Uh, many of them have special circumstances. Their name isn't on the roster list. They've brought in um, an absentee ballot that you have to take care of. Or there's something else wrong and you have to give them a provisional ballot. So at any time, you're preoccupied with a lot of things going on, a lot of people asking questions. They're asking questions about the machines. You're trying to show them how to insert the card. You're trying to explain things for them. And there was absolutely no way that I could have monitored anyone committing fraud on these machines. Even before there were studies from, uh, from computer scientists who were saying that there's something wrong with the software of the major manufacturers of voting machines, or because there were outcries from, from one jurisdiction or another that votes had been lost, it was apparent to me as a, as a physicist, a technical sort of person, that things could go wrong. And it is as much that things could go wrong as that they actually do go wrong that means that we need a, another kind of audit, a backup, uh, or in the case of my bill, a, a voter verified paper trail that serves as the, 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 the real backup, the solid backup for an electronically recorded vote. A dependable voting system is one that can be verified. And you can't verify a computerized voting system if it's entirely paperless, entirely computerized, the software is totally proprietary, secret, not open to public inspection. You can't verify that election. The big problem with touchscreen voting is that you can't recount it. I mean, the computer says, I counted one, two, three, and no matter how many times you ask the computer, it's going to say, I counted one, two, three. Maybe the voter marked three, two, one, but there's no way to see that because there's nothing. It's off in cyberspace. There's no ballot. Here's my ballot. Here's how the people voted. We've had, we've had a contest that were three votes apart. We sat down, took out the vote, took out the ballots, and counted them. One, two, three, four, five, six. Lo and behold, there were three votes difference. I mean, you can do that. You can't do that with a touchscreen machine. So that's why... So many people believe it's essential that we have this voter verified paper audit trail that we can use to make sure that what goes inside that touchscreen machine is what the voter intended. A uh, voter verifiable audit trail, sort of the most general definition, is that when you vote, a permanent record is made of your vote. And you can check that that permanent record is made correctly, uh, which means you have to have some trustworthy way of doing that. So an obvious way to do that is your permanent record is on paper and the mechanism you use to verify it is your eyeballs. Then that record has to be saved so they can do a recount. For various reasons, you don't want to give it to the voter to take away from the polling place because people worry about vote selling and coercion. Your boss says you have to vote for somebody, bring back the proof that you voted for that person, for example. So you don't allow that to happen. You keep the thing. If we have a piece of paper that the voter gets to see, and it's very important that they not only see it, but that they have the opportunity to spoil it and say no, that piece of paper is wrong, shred it or whatever you do to it to make it go away and then produce a piece of paper that's right. And then we need surprise re recounts in some of the districts so that we can uh, catch the case where the, the pieces of paper don't match the electronic tally. Uh, it's interesting that the, the strongest proponents of a voter verified paper trail around the country are computer scientists. They're not afraid of computers. They just understand that they're is um, a, a, a gap between the casting of the vote and the recording of the vote. Um, and I think it can be fixed in a way that will maintain the confidence of voters, which is uh, the goal of this. It's even in the title of my bill, which is the Voter Confidence and Accessibility Act. The movement toward verifiable voting systems is not just about the voter verified paper trail. I mean, the voter verified paper trail is a cornerstone of the movement. But you can't stop there because you also need to make sure that we have routine verification of automated vote totals. And if we have that voter verified paper trail, but you don't do anything with it, if it just sits there and you don't ever count it, 
um, then you can still have, you still have the same risks of vote fraud or accidental vote counting problems going undetected. The Voter Verification Act or the uh, Voter Confidence and Accessibility Act uh, would primarily provide a voter verified paper trail. So each voter would be able to um, verify, to validate that the vote that is recorded is the same as the vote that the voter intended to cast. And that paper trail will be the vote of record so that if there's a recount, that would be um, uh, wh what is counted. Um, the, the legislation would also uh, require that the software for electronic voting machines be available for inspection, not be proprietary. And it also calls for a mandatory spot check um, surprise audit recount in one half of one percent um, of the um, of the voting places. My greatest fear is that we won't have a basis for trusting elections anymore. It's not that there'll be widespread fraud or that there'll be visible fraud. It's that every single election there will be some question, or every close election, there'll be some question about who really won. And if you have a situation where in every election there's a question about whether the losers lost or not, I think uh, you lose the property where you've, you're governing with the consent of the governed. And I think that will lead to certainly increased cynicism and maybe even social unrest. Voting systems are very different from other systems. Uh, you have average individuals without PhDs in computer science who are voting and they need to have a reason to have confidence in the system and just because the computer scientists are saying yeah trust us we looked at it it's good you shouldn't have to trust computer scientists we don't want them running the world and you shouldn't have to trust politicians you should be able to verify for yourself and get some reasonable confidence and reason to believe that your vote counted and that there's some hope that in a recount your vote will continue to count. People have to act now. I mean basically elections have been handed over to the election community which consists of vendors, election officials, and the people who orbit around them. Not universally, but as a rule, they're gung-ho for this conversion to touchscreen machines. Whether that, you know, stopping that is going to depend on the American people. We've tried everything else. We've tried talking to the politicians and having them listen to the computer scientists, uh, and they didn't. And so it has to be a grassroots effort to persuade the people that represent us that this is not what we want. We want a system we can trust. And that's what has to happen. The potential loss of our vote through high technology is one of the most critical issues we will face in the next decade. And we must insist that it becomes a top priority in all political debates. That means we must not let candidates sidestep or straddle this issue. We must not let them play word games with maybe yes and maybe no. We must hold their feet to the fire until they declare unequivocally in favor of a system that regardless of its technology, whether expensive machines or inexpensive paper systems, produces a permanent record that voters can see and verify at the time their votes are cast. The message we must deliver is simple. Invisible ballots are a bad idea. Visible ballots are the only way to guarantee the integrity of our vote and the future of our freedom.